Whoever said, don't question things? We say, question everything. Questions seek answers like an artist seeks a muse, like a poetic voice seeks to open hearts. Questions don't wait for progress. They break through barriers to reframe the future toward equity and unity. Some will try to silence your questions. Ask them anyway. Because the better the question, the better the answer, the better the world works. Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's event, Equal Pay Day and Equity at Work, powered by EY. During this event, you will be able to connect with other attendees under the Ideas tab of Slido. You can do so by scanning the QR code or visiting slido.com and entering the code hashtag Equal Pay Day. Now, please welcome Moira Forbes, Executive Vice President, Forbes, and President and Publisher, Forbes Women. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for being a part of today's event, taking the time out of your busy schedules for such an important conversation. So thank you to all of you who are joining us. I also want to say a quick thanks to EY and Kelly Greer for helping to bring such an important set of conversations to life in the hour ahead. Tomorrow, as you all know, marks Equal Pay Day, which is a date that symbolizes how far into the year women have to work in order to earn the same amount that men earned the year before. And while this date represents the average gap for women, women of color in the US experience a wage gap that is far more severe, and in some cases, even double the average pay disparity. For black women, for example, equal pay day won't arrive until August 3rd. And for Latinas, that date is October 21st. They earn just 55 cents on the dollar earned by white men. So why is Equal Day, Pay Day such an important moment? It serves as a stark reminder and a lens through which we need to talk about the entrenched biases that persist and the inequities that are built into our culture, our workforces, and society at large. It's also an important measure for how women are faring in the workplace. It's a critical part of driving a more inclusive workplace. So Equal Pay Day is less of a day to celebrate and it's really more of a moment for us to recognize the work that needs to be done, the work that remains to make workplace equality a reality. As COVID-19 threatens to erase the hard-won gains for women's advancements that have been made in recent decades, this work has taken on even greater urgency. Uh, even before the pandemic, the World Economic Forum predicted that at the current rate of progress, it would take us to the until the end of the year 2059 for women to achieve equal pay. But that push for progress looks so fragile right now. As we all know, women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Childcare solutions are scarce. The pressure to balance work and parenting has increased. And women have either dropped out of the workforce at higher rates than men or suffered far more significant job losses. And because of that, women now also are at a higher risk for suffering really dangerous and damaging earning penalties as a result of the pandemic. When women aren't paid fairly, that hits everyone and that hits the economy harder and much harder during this crisis. If we have any chance of ensuring that women don't lose further ground because of this crisis, we need to keep the issue of gender equality at the top of the agenda, high on the agenda which is why all of us are here today. Throughout today's conversations, we're gonna take a closer look at the gender pay gap. We're gonna hear from an extraordinary community of women and change makers who are gonna share some of the most effective and quickest actions to close gaps, as well as other gaps, not just the pay gap, but gaps that, that continue to exacerbate longstanding inequities. We're also gonna be exploring this issue through the lens of sports, an industry that's an indicative uh, of the pattern of gendered inequities across our society. 
the extreme discrepancies faced by female athletes, which you'll hear about in a little while, aren't just really about the pay gap. It's about something much bigger. They sp speak more broadly to the opportunity gaps between female and male sports leagues and the hurdles that stand in the way of competing on a truly level playing field. Women's sports won't achieve, a par achieve parity if the challenges that keep them in the trenches remain, nor will women achieve equality in the workplace or across any aspect of our society if we don't double down our efforts to create a more equal and inclusive workforce. Our future depends on it, our society depends on it, our growth depends on it, so it's a priority. We're convening the conversations here today to create solutions that can be shared tomorrow on equal pay day. So we ask that if you hear a new idea, if something stands out to you, if something sparks new thinking, please share it, pay those insights forward. We need to continue to push on these important conversations, not just tomorrow, but in the weeks and months and years ahead. Our idea with these events is to always translate ideas into action and to learn from women on the front lines of progress. If one of the damaging legacies of COVID-19 may be a widened gender gap, pay gap, we have to ask ourselves, how can we use this crisis to offer a reset as we look to rebuild and reimagine traditional structures and institutions? As society rebuilds, an equal future could be possible too. Gaps don't close on their own, as we know. So hopefully we can use this moment to push forward to help drive gender equality further and faster so that Equal Pay Day will become January 1st for everybody. So again, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you to EY and Kelly Greer, who you hear from uh, in just a moment. And hopefully we can galvanize some exciting ideas and solutions together. And as I said, in the weeks and months ahead, thank you. Now for our first conversation, Closing Gaps and Advancing Equality, please welcome Kelly Greer, U.S. Chair and Managing Partner and America's Managing Partner, EY, and welcome back interviewer Moira Forbes. Kelly, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I'm especially excited for this conversation because you're not only someone who has done so much incredible work at EY and in the business community around issues of, of equal pay and beyond, but you've also been so personally committed uh, to advancing opportunity for women across their careers. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Moira. And uh, on behalf of all of us at EY, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to convene on such an important topic. As you said, I think we all need to bring a real sense of urgency to this issue. And uh, we're very happy to be here. And it's an honor for me to join uh, you in this conversation. So I wanna start off just laying a foundation of where you 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 see this issue and, and, and where you see uh, the conversation uh, on women in the workforce at this moment in time. You know, as I mentioned at, 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 in my introduction, we're at what I would sort of call this coronavirus crossroads that could impact the progress of work equality for years. And the fight for equal pay extends far beyond a paycheck and it represents a broader set of issues that perpetuate pervasive inequities, that perpetuate this, this vicious cycle. Uh, as you, you, you take a look at the landscape today, talk a little bit about where you see we are, where, we, where you think we are today, and how this issue of the gender pay gap ladders up into some of these really, really critical conversations that have to be at the forefront. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it starts, first of all, with acknowledging that while this past year has been devastating, for all of us, it's been an extraordinary period of time uh, for all of us to have endured, but there is without a doubt, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, an outsized impact on women and women of color in particular. And I think it's really important understanding the data that informs the current state uh, to really catalyze that, that urgency that you referenced and I uh, fully uh, support you in. Uh, first of all, uh, what's unique about this past recession is that unlike 
the previous four recessions, the, particip the women's participation in the workforce actually declined. And in every previous recession, that gap actually closed. And so this, this is a, a pretty significant um, disproportionate negative impact. And when you look at what that means in terms of raw data, by January of, 20, January of this year, US women labor force participation had actually dropped to its lowest levels since April of 1987. So it had gone from about 58% in January of 2020 to uh, less than 56% uh, with where we are today. So uh, just an absolutely extraordinary impact uh, and a very devastating impact of, of women's participation in the workforce. In addition to that, during that same period of time uh, over the last year, we've actually seen that um, women's wage and salary earnings gap has increased. So it had been 191 uh, a year ago, and it's actually, I'm sorry, it had been 185 a year ago, and it's up to 191. So we have fewer women in the workforce and they're making even less money than they were before. You referenced this pay penalty when you step out of the workforce, and that has an average 7% impact of uh, women rejoining the workforce, taking the same job, but for 7% pay, uh, less pay than, uh, than they had before, before leaving the, the workforce. We're seeing the same at the top of the house. This year, actually CEO appointments, women CEO appointments had declined in half from where it had historically been. Uh, it was too low at 12%, but it actually dropped to 6%. So really across the board, what we're seeing and the data is telling us is that this has had a really devastating impact on women, their participation in the workforce, all of the efforts associated with pay, pay equity and our ambitions around elevating women to the highest posts, knowing how significant that is to the overall objectives around economic prosperity, as well as role modeling and just closing the, the, the pay and the gender equity gap that um, we've been working for so many years, literally, to close. And we've, uh, we're right now on the precipice of, of potentially going backwards in a very material and very adverse way. It's extraordinary to think about it when you walk through those numbers, right? That this progress within a matter of 12 months that women have made and fought for um, across decades can be erased so quickly. I think it underscores how fragile um, some of the, the, the structures in place around um, the dynamics of, of workforce and, and really advancing um, talent still are, um, and I wanna dig deep on that a little bit, but as it relates to COVID-19 and the pandemic and the repercussions that you just mentioned, um, you know, you've been someone, and I wanna talk about the efforts that you've led around um, gender advancement at EY and creating a more work, uh, inclusive workforce, but how has COVID-19 put a sharper focus or changed the ways in which you're thinking about these issues? within you know, your own leadership agenda, but even some of uh, the efforts that you really feel like need to be prioritized at this moment in time. Yeah, absolutely, Moira. Well, I think it's important also to understand the economic impact of what I just described. You know, people come at this from different perspectives and they're motivated or persuaded based on different dynamics, whether it's the moral authority, whether it's the economic authority. The economic consequences of what I just described is quite devastating for the country. If we have uh, just 1% of women, step working mothers step out of the workforce, the economic impact is... $8.7 billion to the country. It's, it's quite material. And even if we have women moving from full-time to part-time, uh, just 1% of women working moms move from full-time work to part-time work, that has a $5 billion impact on lost wages and economic prosperity. So there is an economic imperative here. There is a moral imperative here. There's a, a society and a social imperative here. And from uh, EY's perspective, we've really been focusing, focusing on all dimensions of this. I fundamentally believe that diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging yield greater business performances. There's no question the empirical data is overwhelming in that that regard. In addition to that, we have a commitment, and I think this year really put in sharp relief the responsibility that leaders have for the care and well-being of their people. And when we were facing the early days of COVID, 
We said that we are going to prioritize our people's well-being, full stop. That was going to be our number one priority. And we really uh, lived true to that. And all of the decisions that we undertook over the past year were grounded in that ethos and that commitment. So we did things that really inured to that benefit, that focused on how we celebrated the well-being of our people. That included looking in particular at caregivers who had an outsized impact, uh, again, and having to endure not just the pandemic, not just the economic calamity, but the challenges of being at home with children that couldn't attend school in person, that were largely attending virtual class. And then over the summer, we're home without uh, really uh, viable uh, childcare options. And the ability to navigate your work responsibilities and your personal responsibilities became acutely challenging for that particular group. So we've done a number of things to uh, to support all working parents, but it must be observed that you know the, again this has an outsized impact for working moms. So we uh, we offered um, a partially paid summer leave program. We then uh, reintroduced that in the fall when it was obvious that kids were not going to be going back to school. We have expanded uh, caregiver backup care uh, giver programs as well as tutoring programs again for all of our people and and all of uh, all of their children. We uh, made a commitment that we were not going to uh, separate people during the early days of, of pandemic under any circumstance. And we were not going to do layoffs throughout the pandemic. And we've maintained that commitment as well. So we could take that worry off of the minds of our people as they navigated through, uh, you know, through the COVID environment and just all of the uncertainty. We also added uh, several programs around just mental well-being and overall health and wellness. And that included expanding our EY Assist program, which provides counseling sessions with certified counselors and psychologists uh, free of charge. Uh, historically, we had offered five a year um, that our people could just uh, pick up the phone and be, be put in contact with, uh, with a counselor. We've expanded that from five to 25. Uh, throughout the course of the year. So people have the ability to reach out for help when they need it. And uh, we've introduced things like a resiliency program. And every month we have a new focus around resiliency to really prioritize, again, the well-being, giving people permission to disconnect, to create boundaries in a boundless society. And uh, the result of this, Moira, I'm very pleased to say that while all of these devastating stats I referenced at the uh, earlier um, uh, opening remarks, actually have not manifested at EY. We have maintained uh, our workforce. In fact, our uh, retention for women is higher than it's ever been. So we've been able to maintain a very high level of overall retention, but instead of seeing a disproportionate number of women leaving, we're actually gaining in retention rates for our women as a result of these, these actions. And again, I come back to the economic impact of this is the ability for us to meet our clients' needs and uh, really to address what the business community is looking for and doing this in a way where, you know, we really do celebrate the well-being of our people and the power of diversity and inclusion and equity. You know, you make up, you, you bring up such good points around this, this new social contract between employers and employees. I think, um, you know, if, if we were having this conversation five years ago um, to be talking about the role of a company as it relates to supporting child care and mental health in, in really rigorous ways would, would seem very, very foreign. And as you look to the silver linings, as you mentioned, um, you know, now as employers, see a, a healthy, thriving workforce hand in hand with, with giving the support um, employees need to navigate the full dimensions of their lives outside and inside the office is, is, so, is so critical. I'd be curious though, so as you, you all are, are resetting and, and creating new policies that obviously will, will um, have a huge impact on, on your workforce moving forward, talk a little bit about some of the ways in which you're thinking about um, from a talent perspective, creating a level playing field to ensure that everyone has a chance for success. We're heading into, uh, after the session, a, a conversation around the sports arena where the, the, the male and female sports uh, leagues are very, very different businesses, very, very different industries, uh, very unequal um, access to opportunity and the ability to achieve success. How do you think employers should be focusing on this right now in terms of, of the policies and programs that you believe have moved the needle? 
Yeah, it's it's a really important question. This conversation is anchored on uh, pay equity day, but I think it's really important not to think uh, exclusively about pay equity. Pay equity is a manifestation in many regards of other policies that have either gone effectively or they have not. And, and so I do think it's very important for us to be talking about equitable opportunities in addition to equitable compensation and equitable advancement. And in order for you to really uh, achieve your pay equity objectives, you have to be promoting opportunities in an equitable fashion as well as advancement. And it really requires uh, what I would characterize as both a you know, sort of a, a, an air game and a ground game. So from the top of the house, you have to set the right tone. You have to be very unequivocal in your expectations and specific uh, targets and objectives that you charge your, your, uh, your team with. And there has to be accountability associated with that. It has to be focused on tangible outcomes and the actions that will derive those outcomes. And that includes having policies that really have been vetted through a DE&I lens and ensuring that to the extent that they need to be revised to, to really promote more fairness and equity, that they are indeed, and that those changes are cascaded and then permeated across the organization, not just at the top, but importantly at the middle. And then in addition to that, you really do need to think about every individual member of your family, I call I call it uh, our EY family, uh, your team, your workforce, and how you are supporting them on an individual basis, thinking about what they need to survive and to thrive during these challenging times, but even beyond what will determine their success. How will they be afforded the developmental opportunities that give them the chance to not only succeed in their current role, but to move on to other roles and opportunities? That is how you move up the the, uh, the ladder, so to speak, that's how you move across the organization and develop a, bro a broader set of skills and experiences that do lend themselves to higher compensation. So if you focus exclusively on compensation, and that is essential, you must measure and hold yourself accountable for equitable compensation, but you have to make sure that that is underpinned by a strong focus on uh, equitable opportunities and advancement and sponsorship throughout the organization, the tone at the top, the execution and accountability at the middle, and then the support at the ground level with all of your people. Thank you, you're so right. So pay and equities are almost a lag indicator, right? Of uh, right. uh, broader um, challenges and inequities that are, are driving, um, driving this gap um, or, or driving the lack of access to opportunity. Um, you've talked about the importance of, of measuring um, and, and, you know, these, you know, these um, key, key things within organizations. We all know what gets measured matters. Um, one of the things, and I think what's really been exciting is we've seen more companies and leaders put, put more measurement and KPIs around these issues. Uh, but we're beginning to also see the next phase of that, and that is around transparency in these conversations. Numbers and metrics create accountability, but transparency is, is a next dimension to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that um, within the context of an organization? Um, and, and I know, um, you know, a lot of leaders I've talked to, it's, it's sometimes a, a challenging um, thing to um, um, have that transparency around goals or numbers when you know you have a very long way to go. Um, how do you see that um, in your role, but also with, with so many of the business leaders that you work with? It's, it's uh, such an important question and topic these days as we think about all the focus around ESG. I mean, ESG is fundamentally about creating long-term value not you know, and really combating short-termism. And when you think about the conversation that we're having right now, Moira, I absolutely believe that the focus around gender equity, around pay equity, around broadly inclusion, diversity, equity for all manifests itself in outsized economic returns. I do think that it creates true long-term value and durable value. So it's it's a really, really important um, element to, to the agenda that uh, has really taken center, um, you know, center stage from a business community perspective around ESG disclosures. 
And in that regard, I do believe that the transparency uh, report and, and responsibility of leaders is a centerpiece of that. You can certainly uh, share what your principles are, your values, your objectives, your ethos, but what matters at the end of the day is how does that actually show up in results? What are the outcomes? And I think that being transparent is, uh, it, first of all, I do think it's it's also a growing expectation of leaders. And I also think that it, it uh, engenders a level of trust beyond just uh, what uh, you know, platitudes will engender. So it's one thing to say that you have these objectives, it's quite another to show what that means in real terms, in terms of where you are and the distance to travel to close the gap between your current state and your aspiration. I'm a very big believer in, in transparency and EY just released a very comprehensive transparency report on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, it demonstrates that while we have much to be proud of, we have work to do. And in having made that transparent and having acknowledged both the progress and the achievements and everything that we're proud of, it also acknowledges the gaps that we have a responsibility and have made a commitment to close. And so without a doubt, not only do you engender greater trust with transparency, but very importantly, you engender a totally different level of accountability. We're on the record now, and that's very intentional to the ability for us to demonstrate the actions and ultimately derive the accountability that, uh, that, that we as leaders have to taking the actions, not just again, declaring the objectives, but taking the actions that derive those objectives. Yes, there's there's been no shortage of conversations around these issues, um, but as you said, it's it's the actions um, and putting putting these efforts into motion that really are ultimately going to be the the game changer. Two quick questions for you um, to wrap up. We've been spending this conversation, which I think was really helpful to set the context as to, to where we are today, why these issues are so urgent, um, and um, what the twelve past twelve months have have done in terms of the the conversations around women's advancement in the workforce and beyond. But for the women in this conversation who joined us um, today who are looking to advance their own careers, um, what's one or two pieces of pieces of advice that they can put into practice now in terms of navigating their own careers and ensuring that access to opportunity, um, whether it be advancement, um, compensation increase, and the like. Yeah, it's a it's a really good question as well, Moira. And and I think first of all, uh, women who have a platform should use it. So in other words, we all need to uh, call on a higher gear here to respond to what could potentially be a devastating unwinding of decades of effort around the advancement and the equality of women from a pay and a workplace perspective. So if you have a platform, I think you should feel a compulsion to, and hopefully an enthusiasm to use it to really drive change. I do think that the workforce uh, has become more dynamic right now. And I, I think that the voice that you bring as, as women to what is necessary to survive and thrive is really important. So seek out the uh, the forums within your organizations to be able to relay some of the some of the empirical evidence that I shared earlier. This is not just about a nice thing to do. This is about true economic impact. And as I said earlier, some people are persuaded by the social aspect of this. Some people are persuaded by the economic aspect of this. There is literally an abundance, an almost infinite amount of evidence to support the value economically from a society perspective, from an innovation perspective, to having a highly diverse, highly productive workforce where people feel that they belong and feel that they appreciate. Bring voice to that in your encounters and in your discussions and make sure that you're not just getting equal compensation, but importantly, that you're getting equal access to the opportunities that allow you to, uh, to survive and thrive. In, uh, in a dynamic world. I love that. You use your voice, which is why we're having this the day before Equal Pay Day to really make sure that we can amplify these, these conversations heading to, in tomorrow. Really quickly, as we wrap up, today's event is bringing together amazing change makers, um, uh, leaders across a variety of different uh, organizations, industries, and the like. 
What's your personal motto for driving change or the words that you live by when it comes to tackling these, these big issues? Uh, so yes, um, in this particular regard, Moira, I, I think that um, the phrase that I would use is the data will set you free. The facts will set you free. And I think it is really important to understand the landscape and to really understand it at an organizational level in addition to the broader societal level that we just described, which is why the transparency report is so important, why the pay equity analyses are so important. And so I, I would really encourage organizations and CEOs to study the data, really allow the data to speak for itself and take the data and the questions that emerge from it and translate that into solutions and actions that manifest in the outcomes that you seek. But the data will set you free. And, and then the other uh, quote that I would, I would reiterate, I think is an important part of this as well, is recognizing that everybody comes at change from a different perspective and you gotta meet people where they are. As I said, People are persuaded personally uh, to come along with a change journey for different reasons, and they all approach it from different places. And so acknowledging that and how you then draw people in, make them part of the journey. None of us are going to get to our destination here alone. The gap won't close on its own, as you said, Myra. We've all got to be engaged in this together, and you've got to get as much of your organization really committed to this, bringing them along, inviting them, creating the compelling case for change, but inviting them to join you and uh, creating that, our, that, uh, that vision of a future that's going to be so much brighter for all of us. Well, thank you, Kelly, for, for those insights, um, for helping to co-host today's event um, and really being such a champion, uh, not only in EY, but for the business community at large around how we can put ideas into action um, and drive meaningful change. So thanks so much to you, Kelly. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to the conversations ahead. Thank you. I do as well, Myra. Thanks, thanks for hosting this. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the balance of the speakers. It's going to be terrific. Thanks, Kelly. Now for our next conversation, Equal Pay for Equal Play. Please welcome Neka Ogumike, President WNBA Players Association and WNBA Champion Los Angeles Sparks, and Bianca Valenti, Professional Big Wave Surfer and Changemaker, with moderator Ali Jackson Jolly, Assistant Managing Editor, Forbes. Hi, I just want to first say thank you so much to Neka and Bianca for being here with us today. I have been looking forward to this since the moment um, that I was asked to do it. As a, a mother of two daughters, a, a daughter, a wife, um, a sister, a friend, these conversations are so important to me. So number one, just thank you. And I know that these 20 minutes are going to go faster than I can imagine. So I'm just going to jump right in with the first question um, for NECA. So, um, you know, the landscape today, um, Dec a couple of decades after Title IX, you know, um, was first introduced, um, we've come a long way. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, one of your quotes that I really love is that you've said um, in your work for equity for women, um, it's more than just a game. It's a fight to change the status quo and to give players a part of their share. Can you describe how um, in this current in this current landscape, what that looks like? Sure, first of all, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Ali and Bianca. Um, you know, I, th I think that to go to my quote, um, that was around the time when we had decided to opt out of um, our current agreement, our collective bargaining agreement. And, you know, there was, there was so much that we knew could change, um, though we didn't quite know how. And I think that that's kind of what was most important. It was, understanding that the change needed to happen, the change could happen and it, and it was in our hands, you know, and, the, and that status quo is something that, that can not just affect what's going on now, but more importantly, and what we most realized for generations to come, 
for players to come, for women in society. We really wanted to be able to adjust that in a way that is conducive to us as prof prof professional women, conducive to us as women in sport, um, and something that truly reflects our value. And it's not just about implementing, um, I guess you could say structure and strategy, it's about changing the mindset that adjusts the status quo for it to be able to reflect the excellence that women so often display um, in their parts in society. Hmm. And I love that you talk about how it's, you know, the work that's happening now is for generations to come because just a quick follow-up question. Um, in many ways, um, pay equity um, issues are no more visible than in women's sports because number one, um, the the women hero athletes have made it their mission to be very vocal and make it visible. And, and also because just quite literally the gap is so, you know, the figures are so large. Um, but also I know that there's been a lot of conversation about how the, the um, gap is a little bit different um, specific to, um, this industry because it has to do with business models as well. So can you also speak to um, how, um, you know, it's going to be up to this generation, the next generations to come to sort of change that business model so that the gap disappears? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you you know, you hit the nail on the head with, you know, decades after Title IX. Without Title IX, I'm not sure if I would be sitting here today talking about these types of things. So, you know, with the times come different fights. Um, but along the way, there's that common thread of kind of being born into it. You know, women in sport are a microcosm of society. You know, it's incredibly reflective of what's going on on a grander scale in society. Um, and naturally, you know, because uh, our existence in society has been politicized, that's most certainly going to carry over no matter what profession you have. And, and to amplify that even more so, as athletes, we have platforms um, that we're seeing being used in more ways than just branding our individual selves. And understanding that we as athletes are a business, um, as it pertains to us having partnerships and sponsorships, we also have now understood that the business of sport, whatever league you're in, is also a contributing factor to your direct experience, to how, how people are perceiving sport, especially women in sport. And so for us to be able to have a union that can contribute to enhancing that and holding our league accountable and ourselves accountable for the change that we wanna see, it's naturally going to get the business going. And then when we're, when we're most authentically ourselves, the business will grow because you'll have partnerships and organizations who want to also align with us. And so then the money and the resources flow and we grow from there. And I think right now we're on the precipice of that really kind of erupting. And, it, and it's really exciting to be a part of this time. Mm. And you said, thank you, because you set me up beautifully for the question that I have in mind for Bianca. We had a, a, a brief casual conversation right before we jumped in. And she was talking about um, uh, in in your in your sport of surfing, um, there's so many nuanced ways to think about um, um, you know negotiating for you know equal pay and equal equal parts um, of what you deserve in the industry, and that you think that um, it goes so far beyond just like beyond the, the income gap. Could you speak to a little bit of those things that you were sharing with me, the things that we have to, the nuanced ways um, specific to your sport that you've been digging in and trying to move the needle, needle forward? Yeah, so in surfing, we've won equal prize money worldwide, uh, but prize money is really just one tiny piece of athlete compensation. And so we really need to look at the whole picture um, and, and look at how we can update the compensation model because everybody is running these content centric models and asking all the athletes in our sport to, you know, for the content and to ramp up the marketing for, and the data to speak to it, like Kelly was saying, um, and while we're putting our lives on the line and sending it on huge waves and, you know, snowboarders are hucking themselves over ledges, 
Um, most athletes don't even have health insurance and they certainly don't have a retirement plan. Whereas the professionals who are the best at what they do worldwide in every other sector are, have all those things. They have retirement plans, maternity leave, health care, they're building equity in stock. So I think there's a better model out there for all athletes when it comes to surfing. Hmm. And then just as a quick follow-up, because, um, you know, as you talk about um, needing to bring light to like all of these many um, issues, not having health care when, when you're in, in the midst of such a dangerous sport, um, when was that moment in your in your career when you realized it was gonna have to be for you more than just about um, competing, that it was gonna be about using your platform to um, shine some um, knowledge and light on these issues? Well, I decided I, when I started surfing when I was seven years old, I decided I wanted to be the best surfer in the world. And when I was a teenager, I realized that there wasn't the opportunity to do so if you're a woman. And later on, when I started surfing big waves, it, and it is life and death out there, it really is an equalizing field out there. I'm out there with mostly men and we're colleagues and we're watching out for each other and we're saving each other's lives. And so I started to look at the, the broader scope of you know, it's not just me who doesn't have health insurance and retirement plan. It's also the guy right next to me. So the, I started using my platform by uniting with three of my best friends. We were able to win equal prize money working with policymakers in, in California. And now um, we're thinking to the next steps and how we can connect with athletes like NECA and in the other sports and what we all have in common is that we are the drivers in the marketing force in creating these businesses. And so we deserve to be treated like owners. Mm -hmm. And NECA, the same, I, if I could ask you the same question, was there, was there a moment where you realized um, that it was going to, for you, it was going to be more than just, um, you know, being in, you know, competing and then being in business in, in this business, it was going to be also about finding those opportunities to use your platform um, to try to move um, the conversation about uh, the gender gap and other equity issues for women. Sure. You know, I, I think, you know, when in the league, when you enter, you get drafted, there's this <laughs> excitement flurrying around and you really just want to focus on your craft. And as women in uh, basketball, we play 12 months out of the year most times because we're playing in the WNBA and we're also playing overseas. So um, initially, you know, I was kind of raised on veterans who talked about, you know, going overseas, making as much money as you can with the opportunities that are afforded to us. And I'm now kind of in the in-between of two generations where I've had veterans who told me, stack your cash and now you have younger players coming in demanding more of their value from a brand perspective and a business perspective and i would have to say that kind of halfway through my career so far i realized that i can have a part in my own value um, that doesn't force me to wreck my body 12 months out of the year um, and I, that is that even is a privilege for me because it looks different for every different type of player um, but it really hit home when I was elected into the executive committee and ultimately as president of our union um, with the task of figuring out what we wanted to do with our, with our last collective bargaining agreement. Um, I, I had experienced over the years hearing so many players complain about player experience, player safety, player health, and most notably, of course, compensation and salary. And I, I think it's important that Bianca speaks about compensation because that truly is a small aspect of things, you know, and in our case, salary and compensation are two very different things. You know, salary is what you make for playing. Compensation is anything additional that you make in partnership with the league um, that comes from the business perspective. And so understanding those intricacies in where I was as a player and also what players demanded and also hearing about their experience historically 
is where I really found myself in a position to be able to um, use my voice, but most importantly, my ears to hear what players needed because you can't lead without listening. And I've, I've realized in our, in our newly formed seven member executive committee of our union, listening is really what has gotten us to this point. And we have to continue to empower players to use their voice, whether it's internally or externally to create the change that we wanna see. And that's the best way that we can hold ourselves and others accountable. Oh, I love that. As a journalist, I'm always telling people to use their written voice, but now I'm going to also remember to tell people to use their ears. I really like that. Um, and Bianca, back over to you. I wanted to ask you, you know, obviously there are, so you, you shared a little bit with us, but um, we don't have time to go into, I, I asked the audience, go and check out what Bianca's done in terms of leadership. She has really moved her industry forward. Um, but can, so I was wondering, would you share with us, like if you, you have this playbook for change, would you sort of share with us what, like, what, what some of those rules are, um, how other business leaders in your industry or outside can take those rules, you know, look at what you've done in the past and, and try and use those for themselves? Yeah, so um... I think that the playbook is still being written and that we do need to look at how we can update the model and, um, and get those resources that we need in order to support the performances and to get move beyond this transactional type of relationship where you win, you win a competition or you don't you get a sponsorship and you help them um, create their marketing and then you retire, you know, you're, you're, you're no longer relevant at a certain point. So I think that once we can move beyond this transactional type of model and um, specifically as a woman, the number of times that we get offered like exposure bucks you know, hey, we just want to use your image so that we can, for our for-profit entity to make money and you're going to get to be on the side of this building. Um, <laughs> like, I think uh, that's, it's it's demoralizing and it's hard, but um, at the same time, it takes so many tiny victories to create a huge change mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I kind of like Neka said, like I just focus on trying to ride a better wave every day mm -hmm. and stay focused on the waves because that's what fires me up. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I love that you say that. Cause I really, I've been thinking about that a lot this year. I feel like this is the year that, um, in many ways, um, women, people of color, um, society, we've grown up a little, we've become a little less naive to those things where, you know, in the past, women and people of color were very um, um, guilty of always volunteering, giving their time up because we believed so much in things. And that is so important. On the other hand, I love that you point back to uh, the fact that your time is valuable and, you know, we're only going to move these conversations forward if, if, if we recognize that. So that sets me up for both of you. I'd love for you both to weigh in on this. I'll start with NECA though. Why, you know, we sit in this room and we hear each other's um, uh, um, experiences and advice. Can you sort of like speak to why and specifically to the, in the sports industry, it's so important to be in a room with another uh, leading athlete from a different industry. Like why are these conversations around equity and, and, pay um the wage gap so important to have not just the not just this day but like year round yeah i mean i think we kind of spoke about this before we hopped on um i was i was talking about how you know what we were doing in the WNBA. we couldn't be ignorant to the fact that things look different in different sports you know you can't just completely categorize all women in sport um, which often happens even though there's enough detail and care to distinguish what men need in different sports. And so we need to hear each other out. Um, through our CBA negotiations, I was in contact with women's soccer and women's hockey, as I mentioned um, before this call. And I was saying, when I looked up Bianca, I knew nothing about surfing. And 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 I've, I've met some professional surfers and I still don't know um, much about the sport with the exception of obviously what they do, but there's just in what I do, 
There's so many things people don't know about women's basketball. There's a lot of people that don't know we play overseas, you know? And so if I don't know enough, if I'm not educated enough about the sport itself, it's going to be very difficult for me as a CEO or as a board of governors to know what is needed for these women in surfing, women in hockey, you know, women in basketball. It, we can't generalize everything. And it's, imp it's very important for us to start with hearing each other out before we go to larger entities to demand our value and our worth. Mm, I love it. Well said. And Bianca, same question. Why do you think like it's important to be in a room um, with other leaders, um, women who are trying to, you know, move their industry or their or their sport forward? Yeah, uh, I think it's important because in in one way or another, we're all fighting the same fight. And so what I think we should do is have some kind of a monthly athlete happy hour with all the athletes from the different sports. And um, I think that would be really fun to do NECA with you and soccer players, hockey players, and we just get on and we start to get to know one another and start shooting the breeze. I would love that. And if if in any way I could help facilitate it, I would love to, I would love to also take that on. Um, and so how about I've called this my speed round because I know I have two, I have two minutes left. So I want to get this one last question in. Um, again, circling back around to decades past uh, Title IX, there's no, there's no doubt that women um athletes, young girls and young college women athletes have are have come so much because of the work done by um, the leaders before us. Um, do you have any tips for, you know, women um, who want to make their career in in athletics, you know, how they can, you know, be the change makers that you have been? I'll start with you, Neka. Um, well, I always tell young, young, young aspirers, the first thing to understand is Sports is a it's a it's a global language, and whether you play it at the little leagues, the t-ball league level, <laughs> or the professional level, an athlete is an athlete. So I I actually always try my best when people say, "Oh, I've played before," and I mean, I was only in my middle school team. You played. That's all that matters. You know, I don't think that there's an exclusivity in sport, um, and it's it's by far. Um, it's character building, but what I don't like is that when you, when we encourage young people to be in sport, for the boys, it's like, this can be a career. And for the girls, it's usually like, you're gonna develop some really great characteristics, you know? And, and there's, no, there's no end game, there's no aspiration. And, and with that, I try to let young women know that you can be involved in sport without having to be on the court, in, in the water, on the course, it you you can you can be in sport with it just having to you being an athlete, and that's where we need women most because if we have women on the court who who have male coaches, male CEOs, male GMs, it's still not being reflected within the organization to change what we need to get changed, and so we need more women in executive positions for us to to get the change that we're talking about right now. And I think that's very important for a lot of people to realize. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, Bianca, for you, same question. Do you have a motto or words of advice for um, the next generation of, you know, women leaders, women athletes coming, you know, up the pipeline to fill this ro these roles? Yep. So I would say dedicate, don't hesitate. And touching on what Neko was just saying, whether you're a surfer or not, or an athlete or not, every day you can wake up and choose to ride a better wave tomorrow. I love it. Um, thank you so much. I could, I guess, as I said, I could do this for hours, but um, I know we have another panel coming up. So I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me, for, for doing this important work. And I, I'm going to keep my eyes on you because I know there's like so much more change to come. So thank you so much. Thank you.
For our next conversation, Equity at Work, How Companies Can Accelerate Progress, please welcome Shelye Archambeau, advisor, author, and former CEO, Metric Stream, and Tina Chen, president and CEO, Time's Up Now and Time's Up Foundation, with moderator Maggie McGrath, editor, Forbes Women. Hello. I'm so excited to ride the wave of that last panel. That was such a good discussion to hear. And I'm excited to continue it into a lens into the corporate world and public policy. To start, I just wanted to share a fact because I was curious and I looked it up this morning. We have been marking Equal Pay Day for the last 25 years. The very first year we observed it was 1996. The pay gap has not closed in the time that we've been having this conversation. And as you heard Moira say earlier, we may need to wait many more years, but I'm hoping that the advice that these women are about to share will help us close it much, much faster. And this is a very crucial time to have this conversation about closing the pay gap faster because of everything we've seen about how the pandemic has disproportionately affected women. My own sources have said that they fear that when the women who've been pulled out of the workforce return, they will do so at lower salaries. And you heard Kelly say a bit about that earlier. But I'd love to turn to, to Shelly and to Tina to ask you both specifically, how in the past year have you seen the ways that fights for equality and equity have stalled or been complicated by the pandemic. I'll start with Tina. No, oh, absolutely. Thank you, Maggie. And I'm so glad to be here with you and Shelley and to mark this important moment and day um, to spur us on to even more activity on closing the pay gap. Look, you know, the last year has been devastating for women. We know that, you know, over two and a half million women have actually left the workforce. Women's, you know, um, unemployment rate continues to lag. It's, you know, for, for Black and Latinx women, it's one and a half times the um, unemployment rate it is for everyone else. And women's labor force participation is at its lowest level since the 1980s. So we've basically wiped out in the last year, you know, decades of progress of more women entering the workforce. And this is not just happening at, you know, the lower end of the wage scale. We see women who are on the pathway to the C-suite who are leaving, who are unable to sort of manage caregiving responsibilities we know at home is one of the biggest barriers. Um, and so, you know, this is, as you point out, a critical moment to actually redouble our efforts and to actually attack some of the structural barriers that have existed for women in the workforce and succeeding. And those are the contributions to the pay gap. They've existed for years. The pandemic just cracked it wide open for everybody to see. And so now the opportunity exists to actually push through that and address those long-term barriers like the fact that we're the one of two countries in the world with no national paid leave. You know, I could go on. <laughs> um, Shelly, you sit on a number of different corporate boards. So I'm wondering, you know, take what Tina just said, what specifically should corporate leaders be doing to rethink their leadership in this regard, initiatives that they should be putting forward? What, what should they be doing? Absolutely. So leaders need to realize that this is not a women's issue. It's not a women's issue. It's a total economy issue. It's everyone's issue. You know, studies, McKinsey did a study recently that showed that if we continue with letting women leave, et cetera, like it's like all the numbers that Tina just shared, you know, it's a trillion dollar impact on GDP in 2030. All right, now, if we could just close the gap, we'd add $13 trillion to GDP. That is good for everybody, right? It's more taxes, it is more opportunities, it's more jobs, and that's for everybody, not just women. So when I look at what companies need to do, it's to think about this as a holistic, it's good for the company, it's good for the economy, it's good for society. This is not a women's issue. When it becomes a women's issue, it tends to be off to the side. No, no, this needs to be front and center. So companies that are truly leaning forward on this are actually realizing that and taking proactive steps to figure out, okay, what do we do? Let me give you a simple example. In many respects, I ask companies and leaders all the time, why did we let them leave? Why do we let them leave? Why didn't we create even just a leave of absence versus a formal leave? Or why didn't we figure out a way to, is it part-time, is there flexibility? You know, it's easy when somebody comes in and says, I have to leave to say, okay. That doesn't mean that doing the easy thing is the right thing. The right thing is to care about employees, to care about the company and to care about the economy as a whole and figure out, okay, how can we be creative to figure out how we work through this? And some companies are being creative, but we need more and more to indeed approach it that way. 
That's such a simple question. Why did you leave? But to your point, simple is not always easy. Simple can be quite hard. One of the other very specific initiatives that I've seen take place in corporate America over the last several years are more pay equity analyses, right? Companies are, are analyzing what's the gap in my workplace and some are paying out millions of dollars to solve that gap. The problem is what we've seen, and this is a nuance to the conversation, a one-time $5 million payout doesn't fix the problem. You have to pay again and again because you might inherit gaps from other companies as you hire from other companies. So that's a nuance to this conversation. What other nuances are there that we're not talking about right now? What are the levers that we need to pull that aren't being pulled? Tina, I'll start with you. Well, it's a pretty timely question, Maggie, because actually today, Time's Up is releasing a study together with Ideas 42 called From Ideal Worker to Ideal Workplace. And we actually took a look at the pay gap and the um, what happens in, inside of companies from an aspect of behavioral design, right? What's wrong with the way we've designed work that contributes to the pay gap? And you're right. It's not just you can fill the gap one time, because if you look over the life cycle of a worker, you know, when we've designed work that is around the ideal worker who can spend all of their time at work, right? That's, you know, never takes a vacation. That's the ideal worker paradigm. That doesn't work for women. It doesn't work for women over their careers. So we're saying you should actually get rid of that paradigm, Work, look at ideal workplace. And when you look at the career paths for women, they lose out when they start at hiring recruitment because they often get hired at a lower salary. Then they have scheduling issues all over the course of their careers that you know leave them out of opportunities of the workforce. And then when they get to the promotion stage, the gap's even bigger because they're not getting promoted. And job segregation is about 50% of the pay gap that contributes to that. So we've got to attack by behavioral design each of those. And in our new report that's out today, we actually give companies nine different in each of the realms of hiring, of scheduling, and of promotions, three different strategies that you can do to change the design in your company, the way you do your hiring practice, the way you do your scheduling, the way you do your promotions to get rid of that ideal worker bias and instead reward managers who approach this from an ideal workplace that will benefit women. And this is not about changing individual attitudes. It's about changing the design features in your workplace so that managers can do the right thing. I love that. Get rid of the ideal worker bias. I think that hurts everyone. Um, but you, you make a good point about the holistic aspect of this, right? It's I mentioned pay equity analyses, but it's not just paying people. It's the promotion. It's the hiring. So Shelly, to that point, what are some other initiatives that help attack this from a holistic level that you've seen be successful? Mm. In addition to the excellent design points that Tina talked about, uh, the holistic element also brings in the culture. This is about changing the culture. You know, it needs we need to create cultures where people are actually committed to compensation and promotion and opportunities that are equitable, right? Across across the range. How do you do that? You do that by setting expectations for managers. I really believe a lot of this sits just in the hands of managers. For instance, uh, how you pay people upon hiring. Well, there should be a scale. There's not an issue of women or men. Here's what the job is worth. Here's what we pay and what we offer, right? Uh, two, a leader's job is to create more leaders, full stop. So we should be incenting managers to actually develop people. And we should be evaluating them and their management skill on how way they develop diverse talent. If diverse talent is truly important to us, then it needs to be through and through our overall strategy and how we approach the overall workplace. So if managers can't demonstrate that they can actually hire, develop, and promote diverse employees, they shouldn't be promoted, all right? I mean, this is, they're really some very simple things. It's about setting expectations, making sure those expectations are consistent across the board so that you can create the culture that you want. Because you're right, I've seen too many times the knee jerk of addressing the symptoms. Oh, we now have parity, we make the announcement, great. A year later, well, we've got to write the check again. Well, you keep adding water to a leaky bucket and you're gonna be adding water forever and you make zero progress, okay? This is not rocket science. We've gotta go into the root cause and actually plug those gaps and understand that at the end of the day, it's the bucket. Let's fix that bucket, okay? This is not hard. It just takes intention. We can put people on the moon. We can create cars that don't drive. 
We can create plants that grow without any nutrients. We can create amazing things. We can fix the bucket. We can fix the bucket. I want to get that as a banner and like put it in my apartment windows. I love it. Now, I think it's the other panel touched right before us touched on this. And it's a really important point. We can talk about the bucket broadly, but we can't generalize everything. And while equal pay day is tomorrow, right, the, the day until which all women must work to make what men made the prior year, it's not the same across all races. Uh, Asian American women would have to work until March 9th. Black women have to work until August 3rd. August, and it's even later for Native American women and Latinas. Um, so how can we specifically find opportunities for these communities, and especially the Black and Asian American communities? We've seen the social justice protests. We've seen the awful, awful hate crimes over the last year. Um, so it, it's, it's a really complicated issue right now, but it, an important one. So Tina, I'll start with you. How can we better support Asian American workers at this moment? Well, we've got to recognize that, you know, Black, Asian, Latinx women, you know, they sit at that intersection of racism and sexism, and they need, we need to address it, you know, um, with as much progress as been made, as you point out, you know, for white women, uh, Black women, Latinx women, you know, are far behind. We did a survey in the summer, in the middle of the pandemic, that showed over half of Latinx and Black women had less than $200 in their bank accounts right then, compared to 37% of white women, 27% of white men. Um, and that was in the summertime. So you can imagine where they're at right now. So we're at a critical moment right now where we need to invest in the kinds of jobs and structures that will help these women. So one of the key things we're working on at Time's Up right now with a coalition of organizations is to make sure that the new infrastructure bill that's being proposed by the administration doesn't just include roads and bridges infrastructure, that it includes an investment in caregiving infrastructures, meaning affordable care, both child care and elder care, in-home care services, paid leave for everyone, and supports for fair wages and labor protections for caregivers themselves. These are jobs overwhelmingly held by Black, Brown, and Asian women. So we need to invest in them and make them a real career. And it's also the fact that women will need these caregiving jobs to go back to work. And we've actually shown at Time's Up, we issued a study that if you invest $70 billion a year as the Biden campaign proposed, you can create 2 million jobs a year. You can generate $220 billion of economic activity every year. So this is as stimulated to the economy as a road or bridge job for infrastructure. And I would submit it's more shovel ready than a road or bridge job because you can turn that on right away. And that doesn't even count the stimulation that will happen to the economy because these are jobs that allow someone else to go to work. And if we don't solve those these issues, black and brown women are gonna be continue to be excluded from the workforce and from moving up the ranks, as we talked about earlier, because if you don't, aren't able to, you know, in an affordable way, solve the caregiving challenges that you have at home, your career is going to get stunted or even lost. I think the economic argument is so, so clear. It's so obvious to me. I don't know how anyone could disagree with it, but there is also the, the value argument. And we were talking a little bit about this before we came on. Shelly, how does pay equity and how do all of these issues make people feel at work? And why is it important to think about that? Mm. If people are being compensated unfairly, then they feel they're being treated unfairly. And let me tell you, people who feel they're being treated unfairly are not your most productive workers, number one. So from a business standpoint, that makes no sense. Uh, two, they're more likely to leave. As a matter of fact, I saw a statistic the other day that said that almost 50% of Black women are thinking about leaving their job in the next two years. Think about that number. Think about that number. Think about the cost to the companies. Think about the cost to the economy. Because when you leave a job, you've got to train somebody for the job. They go to a new job. They have to get trained. You, you lose collectively years right, of actual productivity and overall impact. So when you create an environment in which people feel that they are being treated unfairly, you create an environment in which your company cannot be as successful as it absolutely could be. Imagine if every worker could contribute to their full capability. It would be amazing. And most, most CEOs, right, executives, that's exactly what they want. Well, then let's focus on it. 
Let's understand how people are not being treated fairly, which includes compensation, which includes job titles, which includes role expectations, which includes the ability to even have the chance to compete, right, for a new job. Forget whether or not you get it. Give me the opportunity to compete, right? It's whether or not I'm getting training, I'm getting development, I'm getting supported, I have mentors, I have sponsors. All of these elements fit in to whether or not people are feeling that they are being treated fairly and that they are desired as employees and seen as a critical contributor to the success of the company. You know, and I will add just to build on to that because Shelly's absolutely right. You know, in addition to the worker themselves feeling that they're treated unfairly, their coworkers see that. And you set up in your broader culture, the kind of toxicity that leads to sexual harassment. Look, if you are not paying women what they're worth and you don't value them, you don't demonstrate that you value them, then you don't respect them, then workers in your environment also treat women that way. And that leads you down the path to the kind of toxicity in workplaces that leads to sexual harassment, which I have always said is a symptom of a workplace that actually is fundamentally broken. That is such an important point. It is all so interconnected, which is why mm-hmm. it's so crucial that we have these conversations. Um, but I wanna go back to a point that I started to make at the very beginning of this conversation, which is this is the 25th equal pay day that we are observing. So for 25 years, we've been talking about this, which is simultaneously encouraging and discouraging to me because of how you know we haven't actually closed the gap. So how do we prevent ourselves from feeling discouraged? Because I think it can feel a little discouraging when you have these conversations year after year and you're not seeing meaningful change. Shelly, I'll start with you. Mm. Well, I will just share something that has changed. And frankly, only in the last five years, really, is this topic is a topic that is discussed much more frequently in the boardroom. Now, should have taken us 40 years to have it be discussed in the boardroom? The answer is no. But the good news, right, what can we see as positive is that it is. Um, And so being discussed in the boardroom means it's now something that is top of mind. It's being looked at. It's being analyzed, right? It's being, and once you first step in solving any problem is actually acknowledging it. So the fact that this is now being acknowledged at the senior levels, I see is a good sign. And it's up to, frankly, all of us as leaders and in the roles that we play to actually make sure that it stays top of mind and not just in terms of here what the numbers are, but now how are we addressing it? Because as Tina was talking about before, you know, pay equity is just one piece of the full puzzle, right? The full puzzle. The full puzzle is we need to make sure that we are treating everyone fairly, equitably. Compensation is just an element of it. So as we focus on trying to build the the strongest diverse teams that can indeed perform the way we need them to perform so every company can compete in the overall marketplace, this is just one piece of it, but it needs to be part of a holistic strategy on how we create an environment within our companies that enable everyone, everyone to actually be able to contribute to their full capability and have the ability to grow and have access to opportunity. I think that I it's entered the, sorry, I think I'm producing a bit of an echo, um, but that it's entered the, the boardroom in bigger numbers is in more recent years is one reason to feel hopeful. Uh, Tina, what if anything makes you feel hopeful that we'll close this gap? And do you think we'll close it before 2059, as Moira said earlier? Well, I'm hoping we close it before 2059. Um, I, I will either be really, really old or not around when that, when that happens. So that's, that's our goal. I, I agree with Shelly. Look, there is you know, one silver lining in this horrible year that we have had is the universality of the impact of the pandemic where everyone has been at home. You know, so spouses can't just go off to work and ignore the fact that their spouse has been at home dealing with kids and trying to balance work. Um, manufacturing companies are telling the Wall Street Journal they can't field a full day of work on their shop floors because their workers aren't coming to work because they know they have caregiving responsibilities at home. So we're seeing that shift where things like caregiving, instead of being looked at as the thing you're supposed to figure out by yourself as a worker, employers stay invested in it. Public policymakers are staying invested. So we have an opportunity right now to make the kind of transformational change in our country around the workforce, similar to the change of a decade ago, right? Right after the Great Depression, where we really changed how we thought about government supports for folks getting out of poverty, for labor protections, for how work should be organized. 
We're in the 21st century. Now's the time to make that change, to invest in our workers for this century right now. And I actually think we're in the middle of the moment where that can happen. I certainly hope so. Um, I have like 30 seconds left and just one more question for each of you. We're asking everyone to share with us their personal motto or words of wisdom for driving change forward. So I feel like the bucket might have been it, but I'm going to start with Shelly. Shelly, what is your motto for driving change? Use your power. Everyone has more power than they realize. It's the power to ask questions. It's the power to shine the light on an issue. It's the power to support someone. Everyone is power. Use your power. And Tina, what about you? What are your... Well, that's a great one. But I will say that I'm going to borrow one from my old boss, uh, President Obama. And because of this moment that we're in, I think the motto is, we are the change we've been waiting to see because it is right here in front of us. If we push hard enough, it's not going to happen by itself. So we have to be the change. But I really believe we're in that transformational moment. Excellent, excellent note to end on. Thank you both so much for your time. I so appreciate your insight. And thank you to everyone at home for tuning in. Now for our final conversation, championing change on and off the court, please welcome Sue Bird, Olympic gold medalist and WNBA champion, Seattle Storm, and welcome back interviewer Moira Forbes. Sue Bird is one of the most decorated athletes in her field. She's racked up four WNBA championships, 11 all-star nods, more assists than anyone in the league's history, not to mention her four gold medals. But today we're gonna to hear about her activism and action off the court, which is proving to be her greatest legacy to the sport. She's not only been a tireless champion in the fight for equal pay, but now we'll hear more about her latest venture to change the dynamics and representation for women within sports and continue to level the playing field. Well, Sue, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I want to start off because the equal pay discussion is so complex. Obviously, no when, when we know when compared to the NBA, there's huge and extreme pay disparities with the WNBA. But you said when people um, say things like you want equality, that you don't necessarily mean the same money as NBA players. And it's actually uh, more, more complicated in the sense that you're really talking about equal investment and exposure and really investing in, in the sport as a whole in a way that hasn't happened before. Can you talk a little bit about this dynamic and how you're looking to break this cycle in terms of lack of investment and lack of opportunity in your sport? Yeah, I mean, so that's what happens. I feel like it's a it's it's an easy argument for some people, this easy way to be like, well, you don't deserve the same as the men. Look at the revenue. You know, that's my my inter my uh, impersonation. <laughs> Um, but that's not, that's not what we're saying with the WNBA. I feel like in this fight for equal pay, there's all different types of fights. And a lot of times what happens, and obviously I have a front row seat to this, we'll get compared to the U S women's soccer team. And that is a different scenario. They're, they're one entity, they're one thing. So to pay, to, to pay the men differently from the women is, is totally unjust. This is a situation where we're a business. The NBA is a business. The WNBA is a separate business. And what I mean when I say we're not walking into the room and I'm not saying I deserve the same exact money as X, Y, and Z player, it's because it is a business. We understand that. But how do businesses grow, right? They grow with investment. They grow with exposure, especially with sports. And for women in sports, I mean, the numbers are just insane. They're staggering the lack of coverage we get. I mean, it's like it's in the single digits. It's like 4% of all media coverage. We only get 4% of that pie. And then recently there was something on Instagram that talked about like ESPN's Instagram page, Sports Center's Instagram page, Sports Illustrated, Bleacher Report, all of them. And it's like still in the single digits. Female athletes only get, you know, four or 5% of that coverage. Those are the things that needs to change in order to have a chance at having a successful business. 
You know, you bring up such a good point in terms of when people talk about it being league revenues, um, that's investment um, in the sport, it's it's investment in time and media, and it ultimately becomes this really vicious cycle in terms of making it really challenging to be able to grow the sport and to grow the business. You have spent a lot of time, and then your new venture um, is focused uh, on this as well, really investing on the power of media and representation of the sports. If you don't have that coverage and exposure Exposure, you don't have that fan base, um, and, and also you don't necessarily have the images um, of uh, female athletes and the role models, which I know you've talked about um, being so important. Can you talk about that role of media and, and why it's such a critical dynamic? Yeah, I mean, the media controls a lot. I think we, we all could agree, you know, given how, how our lives have been the last year. And as it pertains to, to women in sport, there's just you can't turn on the TV and, and hear about someone's career or hear a storyline, maybe even hear some drama. That doesn't really exist for our world. Every now and then you might catch a highlight. They might have covered a game and they see like, oh, so-and-so beat so-and-so by five points. But you, you don't get to know the ins and outs. And a lot of what drives sports is those storylines. And I think for a lot of us, we haven't even realized just the consumption we've had for male sports. We know so much about it. To, but even if you're not a fan, you know so much about it. And so women have really never had that opportunity. And, and you brought up this production company that I've recently um, become a part of, founded, called Together. And all the things I talked about before, all the percentages, the small amounts, this is our way, the four of us, myself, Alex Morgan, Chloe Kim, Simone Manuel, of trying to change that landscape. Because all the things we're talking about, it's like, it's optics, it's perception, it's changing that and getting more fans. It's also this aspect of, you know, when I was a little kid, I didn't have female athletes to aspire to be. I, it didn't really, I didn't really see any till I was like 13, 14, 15, you know? Which is crazy, right? Crazy that you, yeah. you, you didn't have that, that role model even in the most, the basic level. I, yeah, that's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, so, and we've, I feel like this, this, this element right here goes across like, all worlds, not just the sports world. It's like, how do you know what you can be if you can't see it, you know? And so I think that's that's really the, the, the goal of Together. It's to get these stories out for all the reasons I just stated. You, you, you're you working with three other sort of extraordinary women, champions, um, leaders in, in their field. And you said, if you can't be it, you can't see it. I'd be curious because you're someone who has gone from um, sort of an extraordinary athlete to an activist and now to a solver, right? Um, in terms of really like um, putting putting the where the rubber meets the road in terms of changing these really, really big things. I'd be curious, at what point did you see yourself as that change agent? At what point did you sort of wake up and, and realize that, that you were the one who had the opportunity to solve this? <laughs> um, I mean, like yesterday, it's like still this ongoing thing, you know? That's what um, I feel, you know, I'm starting to see the most interesting part about my career isn't necessarily the wins and the losses or the championships. It's that I've been playing for so long. So when I entered the league in 2002, I mean, the league was different. What we were, how we were marketing it was different. And really like the vibe of like, society was different around women. You know, I don't think I'm saying anything outrageous. And so to see all the change that has happened, to see where we are now, a lot of what I'm doing, I mean, you said activist, which I think is a compliment. I don't, I feel like I'm like supporting activism, you know, cause activists, it's like its own little job. That's so difficult. They deserve so much, um, so many props cause it's so tough. So I feel like, again, what's happening is I don't know, I look back on my career and I'm like, wait, I, I knew all these things. I was complaining about these things. I just wasn't saying them. And now we have an opportunity, I think, where women are given more of a microphone, are given or are allowed, which is, I hate saying it that way, but to use their platform more. And now I just feel like, okay, I have all this experience. I've seen so much. I want to be a part of this change. Not for me. Like I'm probably not going to be the beneficiary, which is totally cool, but I want, you know, younger people to have a different set of opportunities than I had. So that's really, it's like legacy almost. Like that's really my, my driving force. You make a good point sort of now there is, it is such a different dynamic, right? Than 20 years ago in terms of even the past few years, right? The conversations around issues of equal pay or representation. So it creates this, this huge moment, but just because you have a voice and a platform 
doesn't mean you necessarily use it or feel confident in using it or, or even know how and where to begin. How did you find your voice to do this? Um, you know, you are obviously really passionate about this. Um, you're someone who knows how to get things done. Um, but was it at all a, a, a struggle for you to jump into this new arena? Um, like, yes and no. I think, like I said, jokingly, like I was complaining about all this stuff, you know, so behind closed doors, like I had all these opinions um, just, just by nature of having a long career. I do have you know, I mean, you know, it's like experience. There's something about that. You just, you see it, you understand things differently. And it probably wasn't until meeting Megan, you know, my fiance, Megan Rapino. she's obviously very outspoken. And, and it was interesting because the things we were talking about, like I felt, I believed, I agreed with, I just never thought of myself as somebody speaking out about it, but to see Megan and how she, you know, handles herself, conducts herself, it kind of gave me a little bit of confidence to start talking about these issues. And then simultaneously watching Megan, this is the important part, like Megan studies, you know, and she's like, she's researching. It's, it's not like she's sitting down, you know, throwing the glasses on and getting in the encyclopedias, shout out to the encyclopedia. Um, but she's like, she's just constantly consuming. And it was like, okay, I get it. Right. Like if you're going to speak about these issues, yes, I have the experience. I have the knowledge based on my own walk, but I need to be super knowledgeable because when you do speak, you're going to be held accountable for your words. You're going to be asked some tough questions. So that's like a big part of it is just kind of, again, like just constantly consuming and trying to be as knowledgeable as possible. What's been sort of one of the most surprising or, or um, toughest lessons that you've learned in sort of jumping in again to this new world of starting this organization, but, but using your voice a lot more, not just being frustrated, but, but really doing something about it. I would imagine that it, that it comes with, um, and again, you're very familiar with this, right? In terms of, of peaks and valleys around the experience of how to get it done. What, what's been surprising to you as a change agent? What have you learned about yourself? Um, so I think one of the biggest like learning lessons slash surprises was, and I think this is kind of like two parts for me. One is this like athlete part where we're kind of, you know, I mean, most recently it's been coined shut up and dribble, but for a long time it was like dumb jock or like, oh, they just play sports, blah, blah, blah. So there's kind of like that, that gets internalized a little bit over time. And also just as a woman. And I think it's very similar. Women aren't necessarily told to shut up and dribble, but it's kind of like, know your role, stay in your lane, that whole vibe. And it was really in our CBA negotiations with the WNBA that I started to really find the strength in my experience and just like the knowledge I did have that was so unique in that room, right? Like I was the only one in that room that had played in the league as long as I had. I'm not talking about players either. I'm talking about like even executives and owners. Like I had been in the WNBA the longest. And I think I walked into the, you know, metaphorical room thinking, oh, everybody must know more than me. Like everybody in here must be smarter. I mean, they're team execs. They have to be, right? It's league owners. They have to be. And it's not about smart, like IQ, you know, it's just about the experience of the WNBA. It's like, oh, they must know more. Oh, they must know more about salaries and salary caps. And after some time of just like listening, not speaking, having opinions, but kind of being like, oh, should I say this? It's, it's kind of going to contradict things. So after a period of that, I started to speak out more, share my opinion more. And with that, I was like, wait a minute, like I can't. And this goes across the board again. Like you can't walk in that room and assume everybody's smarter. So that's the lesson I learned. And it's not about assuming you're the smartest, but it's this understanding, this is a level playing field. We're all bringing something and you can't, you can't like hold yourself back out of like fear, be intimidated by who may or may not be in like, quote unquote, that room. And you make such a good point because I still to this day walk into a room, right? Where there's sort of what you think sort of experts, right? People who, who have sort of years and decades of knowledge. Um, and then you walk out of the room and you're like, wait a second, like, I, I, I knew something like I knew more than they did or, or that you could add something. It is sort of, it's you, sometimes you have to have those moments that shift your confidence or realize that to, to help you realize, and appreciate the value that you can bring and that only you can bring to the table in a way that's so, you know, so critical. Um, I'd be curious because again, you started using your voice, but you launched together with this really, really big mission to change the narrative around women in sports to break a lot of the stereotypes to be able to share the stories that that have never gotten 
told before. Um, how are you thinking about bringing those stories and, and what's really important to you right now? At least again, you're, you're uh, you know, some amazing women have founded this with you, but for you personally, what are the stories and the narratives that you really want to rewrite or expand? I mean, that's what's so interesting. It's not necessarily about rewriting them. They've never been told. Like, you know, it's like yeah, you're right. you're like 101. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, because you know, for me and my experience, just like as a media, you know, viewer, I put on, you know, I don't I don't ESPN, it's like the love hate because like they put us on TV, but like we want more. So it's like this constant. But like, you know, you put on ESPN and and I kind of touched on this before. What I want to change is boop, you turn the TV on and it's just the highlight. And there's not a lot of knowledge about what's happening. There's no background. And if we want to use the NBA as the comparison, I don't love comparing us to the NBA, but I'll do it for this. If you put that on, I know like what LeBron James had for breakfast. I know, you know, what Damian Lillard, you know, how many kids he has. You just know so much because they talk about it. You have the talking head shows that'll speak about these issues and debate and talk and argue. And you have to know the stories to have shows like that. And those are the shows I'm not saying they're the, they're the end all be all, but it's a part of the landscape that women need to break through. Like we can't just be one highlight. We need to be a talking point. The WNBA this year had so much movement in free agency, like major blockbuster moves, but nobody talks about it. It's like, they're there, they're there. So that's what together is. Together is just getting the stories that have always been there and giving them the, the shine they deserve. And, and there's a, an assumption that that you know the stories aren't being told because there isn't an interest or demand, and we've seen that across so many industries, right? Like, look what's happening in the entertainment industry, and it's funny because through, I have a young son who has just gotten into football. There's not the football is never on in our house, but I'm amazed how many moments throughout our lives that he has seen it on TV or has exposure to it and think about collectively over that over time sort of the opportunities that are missed and the stories that are missed but also for you know younger generations as they think about this sport again it perpetuates this this cycle um, that that you guys are looking to break when other women are looking at the work that you're doing outside of sports what do you think are some of the lessons that they can take away from what you're doing? You, you talked about, which I love, you know, around it, you're, don't, don't be shy about your opinions um, and don't assume that everyone's smarter than you. What are some other, other things that you hope people can take away? Um, I think along the same lines, um, you know, you don't want to make that assumption and, and simultaneously you also want to have expectations like you want to be expected to treat be treated equally you want to be expected to get the same money as your counterpart wherever you work i think a lot of times and i use myself like i always joke like it's like not that funny but it's kind of funny like i do have some like ptsd from my early years in the WNBA. like i should just be thankful to have a job i shouldn't demand or ask for more oh what you're taking this for granted you know and it still lives in there sometimes. And what I find with, which is, this is a great thing. What I find with younger generations is they're like, they expect things. They're like, no, like, like, what do you mean? Like we deserve charter flights or I can't think of an example, but, um, and I, I love that. And I feel like a lot of girls can learn from that. A lot of women can learn from that. You have to expect these things. You have to walk into the, the room and expect them. Um, so I think that's another, like another key point about it. And, and the only, the last thing I would say is challenge, you know, if something's being done a certain way, I'm big on this. I, I love doing it in every aspect. Like, wait, why do we do it that way? Like ask that question because nine times out of 10, I'm sure you could attest to this. The answer is, oh, I don't know. We've just always done it that way. And it's like, wait a minute. Like, wait, that can't, like, that can't be the reason, you know? So I find that asking that question and challenging people in that way, it, 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 it lends to like real actual change. You um, are someone who is a role model for so many in, in the sports arena and beyond. Um, and you're someone who given the course of your career, your experience and, and the work that you're doing is such an, a powerful voice um, and a powerful agent for change. Um, particularly at this this moment where there is so much opportunity to have these discussions to be able to to push forward, I'd be curious. How do you define the term power? What does power mean to you at this point in your life? Oh, 
Um, gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, it's, it's, it's where I find power, like in myself, it's definitely in, um, like all the things we've talked about, like kind of getting to the point where I am like embracing them and acknowledging them, like whether it's my experience, um, whether it's just like the tangible things that I've been able to kind of figure out through time that to use in my leadership skills, like really just like owning them and kind of like, I mean, honestly, it's just being yourself. I guess that's what I'm getting to. You know what I mean? Like that's what power is. It's like acknowledging like what you're good at, what you're not good at. So I feel like acknowledging what you're good at and really like owning that, acknowledging what maybe you're not so good at and being kind to yourself. Like don't beat yourself up over it. That's a big part of it. And I think all of those things, it, it, it just leads to like authenticity, which is so big. I think, I think authenticity is like the most powerful thing that, that a person can find within themselves. Cause then that will again, lead to like confidence and allow you to, you know, be who you are in the world. It's the unlock, but I feel like sometimes the things that sound the most simple are the hardest, right? To actually sort of own who you are and to, to own your strengths and weaknesses. Like that can, can take a whole lifetime. And if, even if you get to the point that you're, you're lucky, um, but it sounds again, so seemingly simple, but that is, I think you're right. So the most powerful thing you can do and the, the most, you know, extraordinary way to unlock your power. Um, as we wrap up um, throughout, you know, these days, the day's conversation, so much of what we're talking about right now is, is how do people um, ignite the power in themselves to be a change maker around something that's important to you? Do you have a personal motto or words that you live by for driving change? Something that, that you say to yourself or you say to others to really ground yourself in, in this opportunity? Um, so it's interesting. So my, my like motto through the years, um, is pretty simple. It's, it's, I, and I learned it when I was like 16, it's tough times don't last, but tough people do. We've all heard it. Um, that, that, that was actually how I found that quote was a very close friend of mine in high school was in a bad car accident. Sadly, he was paralyzed. And after like, you know, seven, eight, nine months of rehab, he, um, he, he's the one that kind of show, showed me that quote. And that was something he was living by. And that's why I kind of like adopted it. It was both personal, but it also was like, okay, like here's somebody who has this amazing perspective. Right. But I think, um, I've, I've been able to use that like in my world of, of, as an athlete, right. Like going through a surgery, tough times don't last tough people do, but I think it kind of, it, it, it touches on a lot of different things. Like you're going to have adversity there's going to be adversity that it's, it's no, this is life. It's going to happen. Life isn't about trying to like snake through and avoid it. Like it's coming. It's really about how you deal with it. Right. And so that's where the tough times don't last tough people do thing that really hits home for me because I've through my career, all the adversity that I've hit, it's totally changed who I am for the better. I'm, I'm, I've never been the same, you know, if I have a surgery on my knee, I'm not going to be the same player, but that's okay. And I think all of that, that all of that learning and understanding that in those moments of adversity is where the true growth happens, that can be good personally, but also to your point as like a change agent, like you can use those things, like understanding when things get tough, like that's when you got to like, you know, tie up those shoes, let's go. Cause you're going to be better for it on the other side. Well, last question for you. You've talked about this arc of your career, 20 years, um, you know, the, the wins that you've had, the medals, I mean, it's, it's unparalleled. Um, but you mentioned earlier that in thinking about sort of your legacy, it's so much bigger than the sport it, it, itself. When someone is looking at your story, you know, you talk about together being um, a, a platform and an opportunity to, to share more stories. When people look at your story, what's the moral of that story? What's the takeaway that you want them to have in, in, in terms of, of opportunity and the ability to um, push through to have impact in life? Um, huh, what's the takeaway? I don't know. I think there's a part of me that's just like, I, I'm just, I'm just a kid from Long Island. Like there's nothing, you know, like there was nothing necessarily like special. Obviously I'm a good athlete, but I'm just a kid from Long Island. Like even in my, even, you know, to be honest, even in my sport, like I'm five, nine, I'm, 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 I should be the shortest on my team, but we happen to have somebody who's five, six. I'm, I'm short. Like I'm fast. I'm not the fastest. I'm not jumping higher than anybody. Like all the things that you need to be a good basketball player. 
clearly I have the skill and the talent, but some of those other attributes, like I wasn't born with those and yet still found a way, right? Like it might not be the traditional way. Like I like to play more like cerebral, like I'm very, I'm thinking out there, that's my strength. So again, I found that strength and I just channeled it. So I think it's just really a story of like somebody who, I don't know, didn't have like everything handed to them in terms of athletic ability, but still found a way. And I, and I love that, which is why stories like yours need to get told, right? Um, so that people understand that um, it's not just always one way um, or sort of one road to follow. Uh, and that's, that's so, so important. Yeah. The one, th- sorry, the one thing I was going to add is also like, it took me 37 years to find my voice. <laughs> you know, like it didn't, it, again, like it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Like it took all this time, but now that I have, like, I'm not going to miss another moment. So that's another thing. It's, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not instant success all the time. So you have to stay the course. But we are so grateful that you have found your voice um, and the world will be a better place for it. Um, Congratulations on the launch of Together, um, all the successes to date. And I can't wait to turn on the TV, um, hopefully very, very soon um, and see more more faces like yours um, and other amazing athletes. Um, That's so important. So thank you again and um, really appreciate all that you shared. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again, Sue, for those insights and to all of our speakers today. I am walking away so inspired by the insights shared and the lessons and advice uh, that was given around how how all of us can tap into opportunities in our own lives to be agents of change. And as we head into Equal Pay Day tomorrow, I think there's an amazing opportunity with all of us who have come together for this event to pay what we've learned forward and to continue the conversations. I also want to thank our co-hosts for today's gathering, Kelly Greer and EY. I've been so grateful for their shared commitment in accelerating progress for women and creating a more equitable future for all. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Hopefully we can come together to continue to push these conversations forward. Um, Be well and be safe. And we look forward to seeing you all again.